her. Katie, please accept. Katie, confirm you're in, please. I'm here. Thank you, Florence. Terrific. Hi, Katie. Hey. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I want to welcome everyone here this evening. My name is Elizabeth Arian. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Land Use Committee for Community Board 1 Queens. Um, tonight we have one item on the agenda. It is a post-certification presentation to the committee. We've seen of the um, Innovation Queens proposal. Um, we have seen this several times, but I um, assume that this is the the uh, certified version that we're getting tonight. And um, I let's see if there was any other note that I wanted to make sure of. Um, I just wanted to review that um, this evening is a discussion, a question and answer on the presentation. And the committee will uh, can discuss it tonight and we will bring it up again at the June 1st, the regular June 1st committee meeting. At that time, uh, we will uh, discuss a recommendation for the community board. In the meantime, there will be a local area hearing uh, at the Museum of Moving Image on May 25th um, in the local area, as I said, and um, it will be continued on June 21st, which is the regular public hearing for the community board. Um, and they, the community board will vote that evening. So with that information, I will turn it over to, I believe Mr. Mazur will probably be the introduction or will it tr be uh, Tracy Capune? It'll uh, be Tracy. Okay. Tracy Capune from the, um, I'm sorry, from uh, Kaufman Studios. If you could you make the introductions and begin the presentation? Sure, thanks Thank Elizabeth. Um, and good evening everybody on behalf of the full team, thanks for your time. Um, I'm Tracy Capune with Kaufman Astoria Studios. Joining me are my partners, Tracy Applebaum and Jay Martin with Bedrock Real Estate Partners and Jameson Duvall with Silverstein Properties along with Aron Chen and Michael Unsicker of ODA Architects, Lindo and Alex Lieber with AKRF, our environmental consultants, and Jesse Mazur and Jerry Johnson of Fox Rothschild, our land use council. Aron, do you wanna bring up the presentation or Michael? I would do that if you guys allow me to share my screen, please. I think the host, uh, the stable participant from screen sharing. Go ahead. Got it, thank you. Do you guys see the screen? Yep, thank you. Can you skip forward one slide, Aron? Thank you. So uh, Kaufman has been in this neighborhood for over a hundred years and we have long supported civic and cultural organizations here in Queens. We've always viewed this plan as something that needs to be for the existing neighborhood. And we're fortunate to have partners in this project that share our commitment to building on the good in the existing community as the starting point. Next slide, please. The team is here to address our land use rationale and other technical matters relating to our zoning action and the uh, seeker and DEIS matters. Um, first, I just wanna do a brief overview of how we see this as a tremendous opportunity for the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Next one, please, everyone. The Innovation Queen sites are surrounded by the Kaufman Arts District and the Steinway Street Retail Corridor with ample access to public transportation and served by bike lanes and bike share stations. We see this plan as an opportunity to build on the good things happening around the studio, around the Museum of the Moving Image. Hi, don't Frank leave. Sinatra School You're gonna learn art. new information. Let's bring the positive energy down 35th Avenue all the way to Northern Boulevard and move it north along Steinway Street. Next slide, please. 
Controlling five city blocks is a tremendous opportunity and a unique one to build extraordinary community amenities into our plan, amenities that can help address some of the challenges the neighborhood faces, like open space. Our neighborhood ranks near last for open space, 53rd out of 59 New York City neighborhoods. This is a great chance to create permanent public open space that will be maintained by us. You'll notice there are lots of vacant storefronts. In speaking with the bid membership and local small business owners, they're very excited to know that there will be new residents and office workers creating more foot traffic and spending an additional $50 million to support local shops. Plus, we're happy to join the bid and help support their ongoing efforts. And we know there's a citywide housing crisis for any kind of housing, market rate, affordable senior housing. What I didn't know until speaking with Hannock is that the average wait to get senior housing in this neighborhood is over five years. And there's not much vacant housing stock in our area at all. This plan can add needed housing of different types and different sizes, including over 700 permanently affordable and senior homes. And this is a start to address this need. Next slide, please. Innovation Queens extends and bridges our sites to the larger vibrant community. In addition to creating new homes, it's creating office space for creative businesses and startups. It's creating a new state of the art, uh, the art home for the cinema that you all know and love. It's 100,000 square feet for our community-based organizations, including a 60,000 square foot community innovation hub located adjacent to the largest public open space. It's creating jobs. Next slide, please. It's creating jobs, 3,700 construction jobs and 1,700 permanent jobs, including union building service jobs. It's pumping $50 million in new annual local spending to support existing Astoria businesses. It's giving our community organizations and partners the ability to expand their programming and to provide more services in the neighborhood. And with that, I'll turn this over to Iran. Thank you, Tracy. I want to talk about the land use rationale, and I want to start maybe with the big picture. As we all know, Astoria has quite defined borders. On the west, we've got the Hudson River, uh, 278 uh, Highway on, on the north, Northern Boulevard on the east, and then Duchess Hill Special Subdistrict, as well as uh, Queens Plaza. And it's interesting that Northern Boulevard over the years through the rail track has developed as a, a predominantly uh, industrial uh, district. And it's only natural that the growth of this neighborhood would uh, uh, infill this zone with additional housing. It's also, uh, I think, urbanistically very interesting how uh, an anchor at the edge would animate this part of the neighborhood and also connect the commercial corridors like Steinway Street and 35th Avenue at the end, creating a destination point that would really tie and expand those activities all the way to Northern uh, Boulevard. The site is uh, situated and supported by all types of transportation, bike lanes, bus routes, and close proximity to three major subway station uh, for four subway uh, lines. And if we look at the land use map, it's quite uh, obvious. You see the circle of yellow housing all the way around surrounding a more commercial and cultural center at that edge. And then the purple towards Northern Boulevard and far at the South is the old uh, transportation utility areas. Um, uh, and it would be interesting. And I think uh, actually quite prudent to close the circle of housing and bring a mixed use development here to engage uh, that edge of the neighborhood. And as Tracy, Tracy said, it is an absolutely uh, amazing opportunity to be able to contribute at that level with uh, five city blocks. As you know, in, in broad brush, the site is surrounded by quite defined district, if you will. There's a block of residents, in yellow, the block of culture and mixed use, commercial on the right in red, and manufacturing and mixed use. And what we tried and aimed to do is bring all of these together into the site and tie the ends into a 15-minute city, uh, a walkable city, 
And with that, I want to uh, uh, pass it to Jerry to talk about the details of the zoning. Hi. So based on that, the land use rationale, we worked with city planning to come up with a zoning scheme uh, that would work uh, both for our development and be consistent with existing trends south from uh, moving north along Northern Boulevard. And to that end, what we're doing is creating a special mixed use district, pairing the existing manufacturing districts with residential equivalents. Um, it makes the existing residential uses conforming um, and it allows mixed uses on the site. Um, so the proposal follows the, the standard zoning constructs of uh, higher density districts on the wide streets um, of 35th Avenue, Steinway Street and 36th Avenue and Northern Boulevard with mid block lower density districts uh, on narrow streets and then opposite the low rise residential over on 35th Avenue, we have a contextual district. And all of these districts together are tied um, by the, the zoning districts and the special MX district. Um, and for our development, that leads to an overall FAR of 7.1. Next slide. So as part of a, a um, large scale district, um, which we will declare because we meet, the, we meet the regulations for a large scale district. And so we would be then seeking special permits as part of that. Um, and I will um, summarize the, so I just summarized the, the zoning changes. We will also be having three zoning text amendments. We'll create the special MX mixed use district. We will also be mapping the entire project area, which is the five city blocks um, as an inclusionary housing area pursuant to option one of the regulations. And then we will be making one modification to the special MX district um, to the large scale loading dock uh, modification uh, applicable to the MX district so that we can um, seek a special permit pursuant to that. Uh, and the special permits that we will be seeking are, we will seek to waive bulk regulations um, on the five blocks. Specifically, we will be redistributing floor area. We'll be waiving rear yards on three of the blocks minimum distance between buildings on two of the blocks, overall height on four locations across the five blocks, and uh, some setback waivers on various streets throughout. Uh, in addition, we'll be seeking to modify sign regulations, specifically as they, re they relate to the, the theater on 35th Avenue. Uh, we will be distributing the parking spaces throughout the five blocks while we comply and conform with uh, the spaces on all five blocks. On one block, we are relocating 16 spaces, which is the smallest block and the smallest garage to the larger one, which is on block A. Uh, and then we will be seeking to modify loading docks because of the unique nature of these buildings, as Iran will discuss in the future, um, where you have multiple buildings sitting over a shared below grade space. We were able to consolidate the required loading docks to reduce curb cuts and breaks in the street front which leads to a better pedestrian experience, a safer pedestrian spirit experience. And then finally, we're seeking um, a special permit because of the way the, the blocks are located with retail uses on the ground floor. The M1 district regulations uh, have certain restrictions on retail spaces, limiting certain uses to 10,000 square feet. And in this instance, there might be possibility in the future to merge some spaces to be slightly larger than 10,000 square feet. So we're seeking a special permit to allow that flexibility. Next. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it back to Iran to discuss more of our project. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so the pedestrian experience was the core uh, and the genesis of our architectural design for this uh, master plan. As we all know, Astoria is one of the most diverse and lively neighborhoods in the city. It has diversity of food, cultural institutions, play areas, et cetera, that are the collective amenities of people who live within the neighborhood. That ground floor collective amenity is what we want to celebrate. But as we all know, these five city blocks are not necessarily contextual to that theme of Astoria, neither in program um, nor in activation or ground floor. And as we all know, some of the structure that exists um, 
are not necessarily contributing. The United uh, Artist Theater at the corner of 35th and 37 is a great urban amenity, but it doesn't do much to the activations of the street being um, a big box. If we go to block number two, looking from 35th South, we basically are facing parking lot with a big box store with a single sort of entryway. And as we go around on uh, uh, block C, the playground at the corner is surrounded by, uh, I think it's a used car sales area, not super inviting. And uh, on block D, we've got the industrial, small industrial stores. And as you move closer to Northern Boulevard, in fact, it becomes a little bit more sketchy and, and less engaging to the neighborhood. So the community benefits is what led us to this entire plan. As you well know, and I said many times, the plan is based on almost 25% of the ground floor area as a place of public gathering and assembly. Uh, and it's designed in a way that each one of those patches that you see in green is visually and physically connected to one another to expand the viewport and to promote pedestrian walk between all of them as they wander the neighborhood. We also think that the ground floor in its entirety is what makes uh, the contribution of the neighborhood amenity better. And so unlike a typical project where we let the market forces or the price determine the tenants at the ground floor, we went and allocated particular places adjacent to those open spaces to promote the right activity. For example, the park that is expanding of their existing playground on 35th and, and Steinway is supported by a community innovation hub. We have digital gallery expansion of the Museum of Moving Arts, daycare, artist residence, lifetime learning. And Stacy, uh, Tracy, I'm sorry, have done uh, a lot of work engaging with local communities to find partners for these locations. And Tracy, if you can go through this. Oh, sure, thanks, Iran. Um, so just to give you an idea, so the Museum of the Moving Image, they would have an expansion space that would be a new digital gallery space that would allow them to be part of this development with expanded education for their digital programming. And, you know, their biggest user is public school kids. So this is a tremendous opportunity to expand their arts education. Uh, Pioneer Works would be establishing an artist in residence program. And I think that would be an exciting opportunity here. Um, we're most excited about this community innovation hub on block C, which would be a tremendous gathering place. Right now, the Queens Public Library is proposing to do a tech lab there. And the tech lab would provide a tech training for all ages. We have the LGBTQ network doing a Q center um, open to all and just a diverse offering, including some healthcare services, resettlement, uh, expanding their aftercare program and their ESOL programming. And of course our partners, uh, I'm sorry. And the other exciting piece here that we don't have a logo for is the Queens County Model Railroad Club, which they're this great group of folks who build model railroads and they want a workshop and a place that they can actually invite the public in for workshops and, and tutorials on how to build these amazing models. And this would just be the beginning because other groups who don't necessarily need the bricks and mortar space could use shared auditorium and event space, a shared cafe. We see this as a wonderful gathering place. Um, of course, we have a great partnership with Hannock uh, to build senior housing here and provide senior services and programming. And our newest partner is the Floating Hospital. They would be establishing a clinic, a full service free clinic. Um, it has anything from healthcare services to social services to dentistry and medical care. And best of all, they are also operating it in, in a conjunction with a daycare 
because they find that populations that can have childcare built into their medical appointments are more likely to go and have a holistic approach to their health. And with that, I'll turn it back to Aram. Thank you, Tracy. So as we said, <clears throat> the ground floor is the tool to activate uh, e equitable uh, type of environment that caters to all. The red is the patches of commercial areas and retail. And for that as well, we've been very meticulous from day one to define a specific use that works well with the specific outdoor space that it relates to. For example, at the first courtyard on block A, you have a food hall that caters both to the court and to 35th Avenue. We have an f &B at the corner to anchor uh, the activity there. Local retailer and grocer at the corner of 35th and Steinway, uh, as well as the movie theater uh, that is remaining, uh, will remain an amazing, uh, uh, amenity, but it's basically raised to the second floor with only the entrance and its cafe at the ground floor. So uh, all of these, again, are we're in the consistent seek for partners for uh, each one of those locations. And uh, Tracy, you can name some of them. Thanks. Um, so Joe DiStefano, some of you might know him through his blog, Chopsticks and Marrow. He's a very well-known Queens-based food tour guide and he is working with us to curate a, a story eats a food hall over on block A. And I also just want to repoint out there's been some question in the past. We're not proposing a new state of the art theater and displacing the existing movie theater. Rather, we're building your existing movie theater a brand new home on over on block D. Aran? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are offering two anchor creative offices spaces to encourage work, leave play in the neighborhood and also provide additional and we think needed uh, space for creative industries uh, in the neighborhood. The placement of those is not random. We'd like to create an activity. If you look at the graph at the bottom left, uh, diverse time of use uh, of different building and different program will create a consistent activation at the public spaces throughout the day. So you see in the graph in purple, office spaces tend to activate uh, spaces, uh, outdoor spaces during the day, in the hours of the day. And clearly uh, Astoria's greatest uh, uh, asset is it's in uh, diversity. And this project is an extension of that diversity offering a wide variety of housing for families of all incomes City has a dire needs for housing, as we all know, of all kinds, both affordable and market rate. The project delivers over 2,800 new homes, including over 700 uh, permanently affordable uh, homes and homes for seniors uh, in this location that currently almost do not exist. Over 300 apartments under 1,000 per month, over 500 apartments under $1,500 a month, and including almost 200 two bedrooms and three bedroom apartments under $1,500 a month. Now, Innovation Queens is looking to implement sustainability measures across all of the blocks. We're studying many, many different elements, including electrical uh, panels or energy efficient buildings, geothermal energy, stormwater retention, reuse, uh, charging station for electrical cars, uh, as well as bike lanes, uh, urban farming on the roof, etc. So overall, we believe that architecturally, uh, the project is inspired by its surrounding, and a lot of the building would be with sort of a context uh, to the language of the neighborhood, insect in green spaces, infused and full with communal spaces and active spaces for all. And what I'd like to do is just take you through a few points of view of comparison between uh, existing condition and proposed, which I think it's very helpful in terms of orientation. Uh, I'm starting on block A at the corner of 35th uh, Avenue, and, and we're looking at the theater, clearly at the corner of the existing theater, and the new proposed uh, uh, office building 
that you see here with a restaurant right at the corner and then the food hall right next to it. And as you look straight into the corner, uh, you see how that would really anchor some activity and draw people continuous on 35th Avenue uh, towards the park. From going now on 38th Street, looking back into the theater, uh, that what is now a wall will become this extended sidewalk plaza. It's uh, open and free for all from the sidewalk without obstruction. And it's uh, surrounded by some of the elements that we've just pointed out. As Tracy says, the Museum of Moving Images right at the back, you see it's a double height space. The food hall on the right that would have a garage doors that open up and would allow for outdoor seating as well as Pioneer uh, with an artist uh, uh, stay and, and work space on the left. And then right across, if I turn my head, uh, we're looking right through block uh, B, uh, the passageway that you can imagine now the right, the, the wall on the right, uh, the white brick wall will become a series of small retail shops with another one on the left, which would lead you directly from the plaza into the park. And then this beautiful playground for, uh, for kids one of the biggest in the area, looking at, again across the street to block B, which uh, currently will be, uh, which is currently sort of the existing entrance to the theater as a kind of contemplation reading area for, uh, for adults right across from the kids playground. And then looking back towards North uh, on 38th street, uh, the street now become lively and you can see on the two sides, the two kind of expansion of the sidewalk, how they relate to one another, both in view and kind of physically in, in the way that they're uh, designed. Clearly the central park here around the playing uh, playground supported by the by sort of the creative uh, uh, cultural center. And you see the theater entryway at the ground floor. And then above it, you'll see the theater itself in Whitestone. Uh, articulation there. Looking back at the uh, uh, at Steinway Street, uh, the, the, the existing playground as it relates in the background to the new cultural center. And then looking back from kind of block D, what's now the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sort of this garage uh, becomes at that line, the edge of the park and the community hub entrance. As I said before, I think that on 35th Avenue, as you go closer uh, to the east, um, you lose some of the activity and the energy that we really work hard to keep. And I think the placement of the theater on that block and the activity that it will bring uh, would energize this, energize this edge. And you can see in this uh, image on the right, how retail at the ground floor, and then the theater, the cinema on top of it, by the way, uh, the roof of the cinema could be a restaurant uh, as well. And that's right across, if you look at the picture on the left, right across of the existing brick building on the right. Here we're looking at the flexible kind of covered area that we think could be uh, become a food hall. It could be a Christmas uh, a holiday market. Uh, it could be just a leisured area and it will be surrounded by small food uh, restaurant would celebrate the diversity of food within this neighborhood. And last but not least, uh, the plaza that would replace, um, you know, what you see here is block D, the garages or the mechanic garage on the left. And you see the cinema at the top of the food hall um, at, at the block E. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand it to Lynn. Lynn, are you here? Yes, thank you, Aaron. Good. Apologies for that. Um, good evening, uh, community board members. I'm here to briefly follow up on the findings of the draft environmental impact statement. Uh, I had presented the preliminary findings of the DEIS to the committee on April 13th. And so today I'm just going to very briefly um, summarize where we are uh, once the agencies have reviewed and signed off. 
Uh, the assessment of the project's effects will be based on the secret technical manual, uh, which sets forth the guidance of the thresholds and methodologies and impacts. And so for this EIS, we looked at the analysis year of 2032. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so as part of that, um, we have uh, uh, looked at 19 technical areas uh, following the assumptions and methodologies that were provided in the scope of work. And um, the project's effects were uh, based on applying a very conservative set of assumptions as defined by the technical manual and at the direction of the lead agency, which is city planning, as well as DOT, DEP and the School Construction Authority. So where the assessments um, uh, exceed the thresholds or uh, it's been determined that there are impacts, uh, we have to identify them uh, as significant adverse impacts for which we need to identify measures to mitigate or avoid those impacts. And based on the application of these conservative factors, our DIS shows that uh, the development of the proposed action would result in impacts to uh, four areas, um, four technical areas, community facilities and services, open space, shadows, transportation, air quality, um, and then uh, as they relate to construction, excuse my count. That was... um, so with that, that hasn't changed since the preliminary findings, although some of the mitigation and some of the additional work that would be done between draft and final uh, uh, would need to be done. And, and I will uh, uh, review what those are. Next slide. Right now, I'll highlight some of the areas where we've identified there's potential for impacts. Um, the proposed action will introduce new populations to the project sites in the area that will result in increased demands to the local community facilities. And as such, we have identified that an impact um, related to uh, uh, demand on the Queen's Public library area branches would occur. And as Tracy noted, the project team is currently coordinating and collaborating with the Queens Public Library as she referred to the tech lab in the uh, community innovation hub. For um, public childcare, based on secret guidance, the EIS assumes that the project's affordable housing units will generate increased demand for publicly subsidized or funded childcare. Um, the project is obligated to identify additional on and off-site childcare capac capacity and or fund to expand those childcare capacity within the existing facilities. And lastly, I wanted to discuss um, schools. Um, I know at as I had previously noted, the project had set aside a site uh, within the project um, area should the environmental assessment uh, determine that a school was needed. Uh, but based on uh, future enrollment uh, projections that were uh, provided by the Department of City Planning, as well as the uh, Department of Education, uh, we uh, there, there would be um, our elementary and intermediate school resources would have the available capacity to absorb these additional students. And as such, uh, city planning and SEA deemed that it was uh, a school was not needed. And as, um, as was previously described, that site would now be dedicated towards uh, some open space use. Next slide, please. The project's new residential and worker population would add demand to both passive and active open space. And so following the city's guidance, the project would not result in impacts on passive open space resources, given the number of um, park resources in the area. However, uh, given the limited active open space uh, in the existing condition, and that is pretty much true of, of many areas, most areas of New York City, um, the added population will result in impact to active open space resources. Um, uh, and the, uh, the other aspect of the analysis also indicates that um, we have uh, projected shadow effects on the sensitive resources uh, uh, on Playground 35. Um, 
there would be no other shadow impacts on other sense sensitive resources. So tied in together with that for the mitigation, we are proposing um, to add additional active open space within the proposed developments publicly accessible open space and are also currently working with city planning and New York City parks on identifying potential improvements to other existing local parks. Next slide, please. And in consultation and at the direction of the reviewing agencies, the framework of the traffic analysis assumes a number of conservative assumptions, such as adding in a background growth to our analysis year of 2032, and that is unrelated to the project. It assumes full cinema occupancy at all showings, and it also doesn't account for changes to commuting patterns as this hybrid uh, in-office and remote work uh, trend becomes more permanent as a work-life pattern. Um, so with those assumptions, the DIS does disclose that there are potential for uh, traffic and uh, 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 transportation impacts. So for traffic, the DIS looked at 42 intersections of which um, approximately half 24 intersections were determined to potentially be adversely impacted. Uh, many of those intersections are already congested in the existing and the no action conditions. Um, we have identified full mitigation at 12 of those intersections with partial mitigation at the remaining 12. Uh, you should, we should all be aware also that at this point, um, between draft and final, we are preparing uh, new updated analyses to account for recent changes to trip uh, characteristics that the city had put out uh, right around the time, uh, the day before um, our DEIS was uh, completed. Um, so we are, we will be updating that uh, analysis between draft and final. Uh, we expect that uh, actually things will get um, better as a result of the new factors. Uh, the next area was transit that we looked at. Air, the area is well served by mass transit with three stations, the 36th Street and Steinway Street, both uh, on the MNR line and the 36th Avenue station with the NNW line. Um, the analysis of the subway elements included capacities at the stairwells and the turnstiles and included the line hall conditions, which is the capacity of the trains itself. Uh, there were no impacts identified at the three subway station stairs and turnstile areas. Um, however, uh, there would be one uh, impact to the line hall analysis, that is the impact to the southbound N and W trains in the AM peak hour. In order to mitigate this, um, New York City Transit would need to add two additional trains to, um, to the peak area. Uh, the current system could handle one uh, additional train set. So with that, uh, we had uh, considered um, that the transit impact might be unmitigated, uh, because we can't get the second one in until such a time uh, the transit system is able to uh, uh, require new system-wide signal improvements to increase the capacity. And that would not be just at the station, but it would be all along the corridor. Uh, for the pedestrian analysis, we looked at 138 pedestrian elements. Those are sidewalks, corner areas and crosswalks. Uh, we have identified impacts at three sidewalks and two crosswalks. And for those that um, mitigation has been proposed uh, and there would be some additional uh, mitigation that would need to be addressed, but those would actually occur not on the applicant site. Those are the soft sites that are part of the overall rezoning area. And lastly, when we looked at parking, uh, the ons there would be a, a a on-site parking shortfall during the evening demand period, weekdays and Saturdays. And that's really an overlap between uh, eight and nine o'clock when we assume the residential demand would increase and the very conservative 
uh, assumption that the cinema would be playing at 100% occupancy, which um, has not traditionally happened. Uh, however, because the area is located in a uh, transit rich area, the shortfall is not considered an impact. Um, and so we have disclosed it as such. Next slide, please. We had looked at air quality as it relates to um, uh, emissions uh, from mobile source uh, due to increased traffic. Uh, what we have found for the analysis is that there would be no impact on public health. There would be no exceedances of the federal air quality standards, uh, which are health-based. Um, there is a potential, there are potential exceedances of the secret de minimis criteria. Uh, for PM 2.5. And I just wanted to define secret de minimis criteria is really a methodology that DEP uses on all projects to determine what is the incremental change to potential baselines. Um, but that does not rise to a level of exceeding any kind of federal um, uh, standards. Um, so we're looking at ways now from a traffic mitigation, what are additional traffic mitigation measures that will reduce and eliminate these exceedances? Uh, and furthermore, between draft and final, we're also working with DEP to refine the analysis of the uh, PM 2.5 together with the revised traffic. And lastly, we looked at the construction effects. Uh, we, because it's a multi-site, uh, multi-parcel uh, development, we made uh, the conservative assumptions of multiple sites undergoing construction uh, at the same time. So there would be overlapping activities. And the analysis there indicated that we would have impacts at 40, 14 intersections during the peak construction areas. And how we would address that is both in terms of early on uh, uh, liaison with DOT to try to coordinate the uh, road, uh, roadway and sidewalk closures, um, and that it would also be done in, in conjunction with uh, traffic mitigation that may be proposed during operations, basically advancing some of the mitigation measures that would be used for the project during the construction phase. Um, and lastly, for construction, we acknowledge um, the use of equipment and activities there would generate um, noise levels that could impact nearby um, residences, those sensitive receptors. Uh, and so for that, uh, we are looking at, and, and we will be uh, obligated and committed to taking on mitigation measures to control some of the source noises, that is the placement of equipment, the type of equipment, and um, to the to the, uh, to the extent it's feasible, we would be doing electrification. Um, and so that will be also codified in the FEIS in terms of the construction commitments. Uh, that's it, Aaron. Bring around we, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. Um, can we go back one slide, please? Um, there was a lot of uh, comments and questions raised regarding uh, whether or not the project would be undertaking a racial equity report. Uh, and yes, we are, we will be embarking on that. In fact, we just had a meeting uh, yesterday with city planning and they provided us with some of the draft guidance that we will be following in addition to the online app that was released last uh, uh, a month or so ago. So we will be um, preparing that. Uh, the deep, uh, we will be looking at, uh, at preparing that um, throughout this month and um, we will release that um, once we've had a chance to seek guidance um, uh, further, uh, for further refinement with city planning. Iran? It's back to you, uh, Tracy. Sure, thanks everybody. Um, just at this point, thanks for, for listening and we turn it over to your questions. Um, and yeah, I, I'll turn it over to your chairs, how they wanna handle the questions. Thank you. Could you give us the screen back, please? Thank you. Um, I do believe that Jerry is here. Jerry, are you ready to 
continue the meeting. I assume you mean Jerry Caliendo, not me. Yeah. Oh, yes, I do, Jerry Johnson. Yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. All right. He's still on mute. Um, okay. The reason why I was turning it over to Jerry Caliendo is because he's um, heading up this particular ULERP for us. Um, but I know he was in transit. I see he's here. Jerry? No? Florence, are you getting anything from him? Nothing at this point. I'm going to try to work on that. I'll Thank you. In a minute. Yeah, I've okay. asked him to unmute. Nothing yet. Okay. Um, I just want to review a couple things. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the um, uh, report, the uh, presentation. Um, during the course of the last month since the application was certified, um, the leadership of the, of the Land Use Committee got together to uh, uh, basically as a subcommittee um, to discuss how we were going to move forward with this. We have, um, uh, it's, it's a controversial project and we have um, a great deal to discuss um, with, with respect to the applications that are before us. Um, on May 4th, we met. This uh, attending was um, the Chair Tony Alley, myself, Jerry Caliendo, Jeffrey Martin, and um, we and, and the district manager, Florence, um, we basically wanted to see if we could come up with something to um, have for the committee to focus on um, the issues that have been coming up over and over again. Um, we came up with basically a, a, a consensus that the area is, um, although there are some businesses there, there is definitely a trend and there is towards redevelopment on these four blocks, five blocks. Um, the question is what is to happen here? Um, the consensus was that what is being proposed is not at all reflective of what Astoria is and the surrounding community. And um, it doesn't respect what's happening, what, what the community stands for. Um, with with the, the idea that the area will be redeveloped, the concept of what was appropriate in the area uh, was discussed. And we talked about the, the appropriateness of having Northern Boulevard uh, which now has, if you want to get technical, it has two 7A, 7X zoning districts on that corridor at this point. Um, Northern Boulevard would be the appropriate place for higher density development had it were it to be uh, to occur. Um, and as you as you come north towards 35th Avenue and where the hardcore Astoria residences exist, it would be lower and it would be appropriate, an appropriate scale for that area. Um, the subcommittee also addressed some of the um, other issues that concern the open spaces. And um, it was agreed that we don't believe that the open spaces that are being proposed serve the general public, that they are really accessory to the uses that are on the ground floor of the development. Um, at, at, this, at that point, we had, uh, we had some knowledge about what was happening, what locations were, um, or I should say what tenants were coming in, but we still believe that the, um, it's, they're not truly open spaces for recreation, whether it's passive recreation, which for some people who don't understand that is non-activities, uh, passive uh, public areas that have, uh, do not have active air, uh, activities like uh, soccer or um, uh, exercise areas, et cetera. So we do, we, uh, 
basically we did not believe that it was um, it was appropriate. Um, with respect to the school space that is no longer required, uh, we thought uh, the committee could discuss some of the other uses that might be appropriate. We do not want to see retail go into that space. We do not want to see offices go into that space, but something that is more for the community. Um, perhaps you can have an educational facility there, uh, a, a, adult education or perhaps something on the, on the um, uh, something like the YMCA. And then generally the other, the other issue that was brought up was uh, one of your special permits. Um, we didn't believe that the um, perm special permit that is requested for additional 10,000 square feet, um, square foot facilities would be as of right. We believe that that should not be allowed. We believe that it could potentially harm um, the type of retail that's along Steinway. Um, and we would like to have that, uh, that uh, either not be part of the special uh, permit or um, that it be, if it does go through, um, that we should have a, it should be considered a major modification to the large scale development plan and that the community board, it should have a, a ULERP. It should come to the um, community board for uh, review. Um, with that, uh, the proposal that the committee should, um, that we suggested that the committee discuss at this point is um, with respect to the zoning uh, there were um, there was an R eight X along Northern Boulevard. Um, mid block would be something like a seven D R seven D, and then within uh, closer to Thirty Fifth Avenue and along Thirty Fifth Avenue an R six A. Um, at this point, I would uh, let's see subsequent to that discussion. And th this has been distributed to the committee members and I hope you have reviewed it. Um, subsequent to that meeting on the 4th, the borough president's office uh, requested a, uh, held a meeting of stakeholders in the community. And um, the community board was there also. And that was um, the, the leadership of the community board representing us. Uh, in attendance, there were nine other community organizations represented in addition to a, um, uh, the Steinway bid. And uh, for the most part, the majority of the attendees were not in support of the project. Um, they did define what their goals were, which were to have, um, to have anywhere between 50 to 70% of the units that are proposed uh, in any development that goes on there to be at or below 30% AMI. Um, the borough president is uh, basically considering what can be done to, um, to move this forward. Um, there were, uh, he, he wants to be realistic about the kinds of subsidies that are available to uh, for the MIH portion, but at this point, um, you know that's the basically um, that that was that was that was what the community was requesting. So um, at this point, I'm going to open it up if, to um, the committee for any questions or clarifications and. Um, uh, let's see. Did, were you able to uh, talk with Jerry? He's you... trying. He can hear the whole meeting. He's trying to unmute. Unfortunately, the Zoom is giving him a hard time. He's going to leave the meeting and come back in. Okay. All right. So, um, if there's an, anyone, I see that that. Um, okay. Evie has raised, would you use the raised hand function, please, if you have uh, questions or comments, okay? So Evie. 
Thank you. Um, so I have a few questions. I mean, there's lots of plans um, that have been presented. I would like to know what is absolutely going to be binding other um, than the MIH and so, the zoning. I'll answer that. So um, as part of the large scale district, um, there will be a special permit plan, a site plan that will be approved. Uh, that will regulate all the buildings and all the, the zoning waivers on the subject site. And it will be also subject to a restrictive declaration that binds specific plans that get approved as part of the city planning approval. And, and that's in perpetuity. But like what? Could you be specific? The open space, how it's developed, how it's used, the buildings themselves, the ground floor uses, the height, the setbacks, the location of the buildings, all everything is, is regulated by the special permit. So right now that would be based on the plans that you see today. So if you say that um, a daycare center is going in somewhere, it will be a daycare center? It will be a use that's permitted as of right under the zoning, which is a daycare center. We are proposing a daycare center as a specific but it doesn't location. Mean a daycare center necessarily has to go in there. It's what the zoning will allow. It's, it's what the zoning, zoning will allow, but our proposal includes a daycare. No, I know, but I'm just saying what's and, you know, things, things, things live in time, right? You have things this is going to last in perpetuity. It's designed to allow flexibility when, when uses go away. That's fine. I'm just trying to be specific, just so that everybody My knows uses. what's My actually, uses. it's what the zoning will permit. Okay. That's correct. I'm My other specific. question is, in terms of the um, draft um, environmental impact statement, could we go back to that? Is that possible? Did you include everything that was identified last time as well? I believe that there might have been some other things last time that weren't highlighted this time. No, all 19 uh, technical areas were looked at and what we highlighted was what was there before. The only new addition was that uh, the mitigation, the nature of the mitigation was something that we were waiting for the agency to review and sign off. Uh, the only thing new that was added uh, to the presentation that I just made was the commitment to do the racial equity report. At the time, we only had the app. We didn't have the draft guidance. But as I noted, we got the draft guidance yesterday. So we are undertaking the analysis. Okay, I thought that there was another area of impact that was highlighted. I'll have to kind of go back and watch the last video. Um, and you also didn't mention some things that were mentioned before as well. Okay. There was well, talk of shadow on people's homes. Um, there was some other stuff in there. So I would just, I'm gonna go back and look at that. Um, uh, I, I would just clarify that the shadows on people's homes are not part of the EIS or the secret analysis. That was as part of the architects, the designers, urban, um, urban and visual uh, analysis. For secret, we are uh, we are looking at just uh, historic resources that are sense sensitive or public open space resources. Okay. And then last time I had asked what the zone school was, and you didn't know. Do you know what that is now? Yes, we know the zone school, and I, I, I can certainly uh, uh, pull that up. Or what I will say, though, is that particularly for this zone school, it happens to be just outside of our uh, uh, community district um, uh, community district uh, analysis, the CSD. Um, hold on for a minute here. And, and the radius of that analysis is what, 400 feet? Or no, no, the, the, it? It, it's, um, it is based on DOE's, uh, it, it's based on the secret technical manual on how they define the community subdistricts. So the school, the zone school for this project was not factored in to this statement, I'm, I'm a little confused here. It happens to be a little bit on the outside. Um, oh, I, I'm gonna have my colleague, Alex, can you? Uh, and what, was it, which school was it? Was it PS 166? 
Sorry, sorry, uh, I am, I'm Alex Lieber. I'm <clears throat> also with AKRF, uh, just to clarify. I'm afraid I don't have the name of the uh, zone school. <clears throat> Oh, wait, Sorry, maybe one of the developers knows because they've been talking to ever going around the whole neighborhood. Do you know? Actually, I have. I, oh, I'm calling great. that up. I'm sorry. It's just a little. Uh, my my computer's a little uh, slow at the moment. So while while Lynn um, is pulling that up, I just wanted to clarify something uh, for the schools analysis under Seeker. Uh, the study looks at the overall capacity in the sub-district, so the zone sub-district uh, for planning for school capacity. And the, you can see that uh, there's a figure in the EIS showing that sub-district. So it looks at the overall capacity of those schools within the sub-district. And keeping in mind that our uh, study is looking, projecting over a long time frame, we're looking at a 10-year advance. And so individual schools may have their zones changed during that time. And we, we can't determine exactly uh, which school. So we're looking at the entire capacity for the region, or sorry, for the, for the sub-district, um, because that is how the overall capacity for uh, the capacity needs of the neighborhood are determined. And uh, so the case- The school is outside the sub-district, right? And, and currently as is drawn, I believe the sub-district, it's, it's a funny boundary how these sub-districts are drawn. And I believe the sub-district in our case sort of ends at 31st Street. Um, and so this, the zone school in this area happens to be just to the west of 31st Street. So it, just from the, the, the particulars of how the study is done, it would not be counted as the overall capacity. But again, the study is looking at uh, overall planning for the capacity needs in the neighborhood, which in the seeker analysis um, for the planning purposes of schools, that is the sub-district rather than an individual school. Could you yeah. please tell us what the school is? Because the sure. school is PS 166, and that is not it, west of 31st Street. The zoned elementary school is PS 166, and that is included in the uh, school analysis. The intermediate school, the zoned intermediate school is IS 204, which is just outside of the sub-district. Same thing with the high school. Okay, I mean, PS 166 is in definitely at capacity oh and it is accounted I mean, for in the analysis so um okay and then um you know we had asked for the details for the um mih units did you have that for us we had asked for yeah uh, if you're asking what the rents will be or for... no we asked for like a detail of it you know the rents you can you know in terms how they were going to be distributed, what the income bans were, the, uh, how the, the breakdown. We had sure. asked for that last time and you said you would have it. Sure, we can pull up a slide, but in the meantime- um, I the, mean, more the, detail, not just like what the rents are, because the rents don't tell you what you need to qualify, what income you need to qualify so for. They will, so, Evie, to answer your question, they will be distributed throughout the entire residential component of the project. Uh, obviously, a senior housing uh, building uh, would be separate from that. Uh, so they'll be, be distributed equally around. Uh, the 10% uh, of the units will be available for people at 40% of AMI. No, I understand. I think we were just asking for the information in writing and in more detail, if, you know. Okay, we're happy to provide it in writing. I and mean, I'm happy to- Are you do that by when? Because we asked for it a few weeks ago. Uh, we can do it at, tomorrow for sure, even I tonight. Does Hanak have that information? They're going to be doing the housing lottery. Yeah, we will. So and I'm sorry, I just also want clarification. So there's going to be the 711, whatever the number is, MIH units. And then there will also be affordable senior housing. Uh, currently, the, plan, the proposal is uh, the senior housing is within the 711 units. But to be transparent with this group, uh, we're in active discussions with HPD on ways we can work together with the city to expand uh, the affordability uh, of this project. And this is a goal that we all recognize the, the crisis that this city is, is, uh, is in the middle of. Just yesterday, uh, the statistics came out for this uh, council member's district and the adjacent one where the vacancy rate is 2% and 2.8% compared to a citywide vacancy 
of 3.4, which itself is incredibly low. So the stress uh, and upward pressure on rents is, is a real thing in the city today. Uh, and so we, uh, just like you, are, are seeking ways we can do more. Yeah, and you know, we've had many re, uh, rezonings passed here in Community Board One um, through the MIH housing program and, and nothing's been built yet since 2016. So, you know, we're skeptical and there's a reason why maybe we don't have the housing that we need because developers have been sitting on properties that they got rezoned years and years okay. ago. Okay, Evie, do you have any more questions? What other topics do you have? Um, I guess I have a question about the concrete that's gonna be used for the buildings um, because of the carbon factor. So I'm wondering if you're gonna be using, um, is it gonna be mostly concrete for the buildings? I can take that one, Evie. Um, so th there will be some concrete in these buildings. The buildings aren't designed yet um, since we, you know, we, we just have massing right now, but we are, are talking with, um, and I've been looking into different types of uh, low carbon building materials. So it's certainly something that we're aware of and are, are uh, looking into for these projects. It's also uh, dependent on what sort of the city code will allow, but there's definitely options that are being sort of um, developed in the market right now. And those are certainly things we're going to, to try to pursue. Okay, before we go on, thank you. Uh, before we go on, I just want to say to uh, Mr. Martin, you are going to be preparing that information concerning the MIH. Yeah, you'll have it tomorrow. Okay, uh, we do have basically a standard request that we make, which we'll forward to you, forward, yeah, forward to you um, either later tonight or tomorrow. Okay, uh, through, I'll let, uh, we have contact information at the office, Florence. Yeah. Florence can send it to me and I'll pass it on to Jay. Okay. I think Jerry Johnson. Right, very good. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, Richard Kuzami. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you for the presentation. I have a couple questions. Um, first has to do with Block C. Um, there is a tower or a structure in it, which is not up around Northern Boulevard. That's the closest to 35th Avenue of the higher structures. Um, I know, and I may have the wrong perspective here as far as the site goes, but can that structure be moved closer to Northern Boulevard? Or maybe it can't. I'm not sure the edge of the of the actual site. Um, and I'd like to know if that structure, how many apartments does it hold if that structure was eliminated from the uh, um, from the massing period. And uh, you know, I'd like to get an idea of that. I think it's very, very important that uh, and most of the massing be up on Northern Boulevard as the board has discussed. And I think we've all discussed, you know, previously I also talked a lot about the shower, the shadows Abby mentioned it also, um, you know, so if this is uh, uh, under the parameters of the architectural side, I'd like to hear more about uh, providing us with shadow studies when you separate the existing from the projected, okay? Uh, I had asked that before, uh, the way it was presented before, it was they were uh, sitting on top of each other and I found it uh, that the perspective was a little confusing. It was hard to get an actual good feeling as to uh, what the shadows were uh, given the current configuration. So I'm still, I asked for that before and it'd be nice to get that if possible. Um, also, one of your slides and, and showing the, the site uses, you showed 38th Street. Um, it looked like 38th Street was sort of a mall or something. Are you closing 38th Street in a certain section? I wasn't quite sure what I was seeing there. So I'd like that to be clarified. And uh, um, I guess the last thing in terms of sustainability, which as you know, is a high priority for me, uh, you mentioned that you are looking at different aspects of it, but can you be more specific? Um, what are, are there issues with the geothermal? Are there issues with going solar? What about creating more green, uh, green space, uh, real organic green space? Um, you know, um, what about possibly being able to, uh, 
either eliminate or reduce automobile uh, usage within the site? Um, these are the kind of questions that I was asking about. So if you could be more specific about that, I'd greatly appreciate it. So in, ter in, in terms of sustainability, we're actively doing a feasibility study on geothermal. So there's a lot of uh, variables, uh, what's underneath the ground, the subway, the capacity of the ground to do the, the amount of boreholes that you need. So, so it's a pretty in-depth study that we are, are currently undertaking to determine how much and where, what the capacity of it would be. Um, so we are 100% doing those analyses to, to better understand the, the viability of it across all five blocks. Are you prepared if for some reason it's not viable to look at the alternative of using solar panels or solar windows or uh, things like that? So part of you our- should be looking at that at the same time. So geothermal is just one element of sustainability initiatives as it relates to renewable energy. Uh, solar on residential buildings, because the roofs aren't so large, doesn't provide a lot of power. And so it's not, um, um, it, it doesn't actually generate a lot of power. So there's, there's different variables to the size of the area for solar panels versus things like geothermal, which you can, you can gather more energy from. Um, but the green space, green roofs, things like that for stormwater retention, for stormwater reuse, no, um, those, are, those are all things that are, are, are included as part of the proposal. Yeah, that's, you have to do that. So, so, so um, well, yeah. so the two, plus yeah. acre, the two plus acres of public open space are basically, you know, cr creating green roofs, right, across two acres of, of site that right now is otherwise regular roof. Mm -hmm. What about... Um... I've been reading up some issues about if you don't have enough space for solar power on the roofs, you do have a lot of uh, windows and window space on the side of buildings. So, and there is actually a use of a film or something like that. If you can look into that to actually utilize your windows uh, to create power, uh, that is an asset. You could, I would hope you would look at that. And also, uh, what about um, water usage and sewage? Uh, you know, like the Durst project did put in a groundwater system, something like that. I wonder if you've looked at any of that that would take pressure off the local infrastructure. Uh, you know, we don't want the same debacle that's happened in Long Island City to happen here. So, you know, when the local infrastructure could not handle uh, the sewage. So green roofs and blue roofs and things of that nature, which we are which we are studying, will help retain that water so it does not get put out into the into the sewer system and get reused, gets filtered and reused, right? For, for irrigation and other things across all the green spaces to, to alleviate the pressure on the sewer system. And Richard, to your uh, first mm -hmm. comment and also a uh, common comment mm -hmm. from the leadership of the Land Use Committee regarding uh, the towers. Um, the particular tower you, you asked about on Block C is actually set back from 35th Avenue. Uh, the architects can tell me, but probably 300 feet. And you'll notice in general with the master plan, the larger towers are not next to the uh, town, the row houses on the north side of 35th Avenue closest to Northern Boulevard, mm -hmm. nor are there tall towers uh, to the west um, at 37th Street. And so there really was uh, intention uh, as to where the taller buildings were placed. That particular one is at the sort of heart of the project at, adjacent to the large Civic Park and, and set back from 35th Avenue pretty substantially. So uh, there really was an effort to uh, be contextual. I understand there's a difference of viewpoint on the subject, but uh, mm -hmm. just understand in looking at the massing, uh, you'll see lower buildings to the west and lower buildings along the north side of 35th Avenue or uh, adjacent to the residences on the north side of 35th Avenue precisely uh, for those reasons. And, uh, you know, uh, I understand there's a difference of viewpoint on that though. No, mm -hmm. oh, well that may, you know, you may want to look at that, but I can't really tell unless I get that shadow study like that. So we can't tell what effect that has unless we see the before and after shadow study separated. Um, I think that that's just uh, really important. I think that uh, I'd like to see that provided. So. And, and there's no there's no closed street uh, in this project. The image that I believe you were referring to is a laneway that essentially goes across the PC Richards parking lot as it exists today. So uh, it's a pedestrian passageway on what we call Block B. Oh, oh. oh no, I was oh on, on 38th Street. You're talking about okay, yeah, okay. 
All right, very good. But again, if the shadow studies, if I can, if we can get them in two pages separated, I think that's very important instead of on top of each other. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Richard. Jeffrey Martin. All right, hey everyone. All right, I have two. I have two comments, and these are consistent with comments that I've been making, um, you know, since day one of this project. Um, one, I'm going to get a little in, uh, a little bit more in, in uh, detailed on, and I'd, I'd, I'd like a couple uh, answers um, uh, once I'm done. And then the second one, I'll just uh, kind of mention and um, uh, would like a response um, from the from the applicant. So the first one, you know, you know, we, when we met on this, um, you know, I think uh, many of us felt like this area was, um, uh, you know, development in this area was appropriate. Um, if proper outreach was was complete, the applicant's able to identify and assist current business owners, current resident, uh, um, residents of the area um, with relocation or with whatever is necessary. Um, you know, we really think at least I do think this benefit, this area can benefit from um, additional commercial space um, at the street level um, that we can use this as kind of a framework to extend. And I'm going to use that word a lot here, but a framework to kind of extend up um, Steinway and, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of commercial up Steinway um, and, and kind of spur development and spur commercial areas there. And then also along Northern. And we know that Northern is, um, developing. Um, we've seen a couple of um, proposals come before the board, uh, come before this committee. Um, what I've always been consistent with since the beginning of this is that I felt like there wasn't a framework that um, is being followed in terms of um, in terms of the zoning proposal. There's nothing that there's nothing there, there's no reason why um, the zones are chosen. Uh, you know, the, the certain zones are chosen um, and, and where they're going. I feel like when you look at a bird's eye and you, you showed one of those, it really doesn't fit within the neighborhood. And I think there's an opportunity to make it fit. I think that development here can fit into the community. I don't understand why the applicant isn't looking at existing zoning. And I understand that some of it is outdated and it's, you know, we're not developing with that type of zoning anymore. I, I understand it, I get it. But, you know, currently um, just west of the site on Northern and 39th, I believe, there's a M13 R7X zone. And that's right along Northern, allows up to 12 to 14 stories. And that's, you know, there's, there's development happening there. Um, there there's, there's buildings right there. Um, nearby residential zoning is R6A, which allows six to eight stories. And just north of the site is R5, which is low rise attached. And again, I understand that, you know, this isn't, you know, really what is being um, developed and, and built these days, but um, I just wanted to mention that it's there because it does go into um, how this development fits within that context, within that neighborhood. Um, I don't understand why an R6A can't be developed closer to 35th or further west on 35th Avenue, uh, 37th, 36th Street. I don't know if I have those streets exactly right. I'm not looking at a map. Um, and then from there, step up to Northern. And again, I understand we're, you know, that this is a development project and you're proposing um, a redevelopment and, you know, in order to um, make it profitable and, and, you know, there has to be certain zones that you're, that you're meeting certain, um, number of units um, and rental income. But I, you know, I don't know why it can't be more contextual. And, you know, maybe it steps up a little bit higher than your R7X that's approved already along Northern. Maybe it goes up to R8X. Um, but um, I just have trouble with the, with the beginning of the presentation when you went into the land use um, justification because I, I'm uh, I, I don't think it does. I don't think it fits into that neighborhood. Um, I think it sticks out. 
And I think there is an opportunity to kind of build up, um, you know, kind of build up from the existing neighborhood and the existing um, residential zones to something a little taller on Northern, but I, I, I'm not sure that this is it. Um, so I guess I'm just going to ask quickly to address that. Um, why the existing zones were not more closely analyzed and followed um, with this proposal. And then I have one more, I have one more question, but I, I want to, I want to kind of focus on this one for one minute. Uh, I'll, I'll take, take that, that answer. So, so we worked, worked with the Department, Department of City, City planning, planning to develop the planning framework on the site. We originally chose a C42F district um which had a, a, a 7.2 FAR across the entire uh blocks uh which had um uh, so everything would be the same um they uh we were de determined that that wasn't an appropriate uh zoning district um we had some guiding principles that went along with the project and that was to create a significant amount of open space uh, it was to create varied profiles of the project, so it didn't just look like standard buildings on all five blocks. Uh, that we create um, active uses at the street level, as well as around any open space that we do to activate the, the commercial establishments. Uh, and to move floor area from the west to the east towards Northern Boulevard, and that's what this project does. So the districts themselves with the special mixed use district determined that the, the, the two higher density districts, which are the R9 and the R91, are located on the wide streets of typical for all you know, areas in the city along 35th Avenue, Steinway and 36th Street with Northern Boulevard as the highest density district. In the mid blocks, we do have mid blocks on narrow street conditions. We have lower density districts, the R73, and across from 35th Avenue and the residential uses there, we have an R7X district, um, which is, 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 you know, mirrors a, a block north of Northern Boulevard and, and, and at 4401, which was recently approved. So um, those were the districts that we chose. With the large scale plan, we were able to modify some of the underlying bulk regulations that allowed that, that allow us to provide the, the five open spaces across the five, uh, all of the open spaces across the five blocks, and also live within the standard kind of city planning principles of creating strong street walls, active street level commercial uses to activate the streets, and to provide open spaces that are activated by the uses that are surrounding them, as well as the streets to provide actual public open space. I, I you know, I, I'm you know, we keep hearing that these, that these spaces are not public and they're private. They're not. They're going to be open 24, well, they'll be regulated by the special permit. They're open to the public and they're being designed to be active for all members of the public. The new residents for the project, of course, but as well as the existing residents that surround the area that have a site and a, and a location that is severely underserved by open space. That's what these spaces are designed to do. And, and those, those were the guiding principles, and that's what determined our planning framework. So I, uh, you know, definitely appreciate the open space, and that's kind of my next thing that I want to get into. Um, but I do want to, I do want to ask one question. I, I, I want to look at mm -hmm. one, one principle in particular. Um, mm -hmm. Can can the activate uses at at the street level along Thirty Fifth Avenue? Can that not be accomplished with a different zone rather than an R9? An R9 next to an R6, or sorry, an R5, which is across the street, is, you know, so I'm, 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 yeah, you know, I understand, I understand your question, and, I, and, yeah. and I'll, I'll try to answer it. So, so in order to provide all of this public open space, which, which will be supported, supported by the development team, team not by city, city dollars, dollars uh, in perpetuity, as long as the development exists, exists binding on all successors and assigns to any restricted deck or any of the properties that are approved is develop it requires it requires funding and that is is to be funded partially by the development which needs square footage in order to generate those funds 
So, so we're, we're providing 2.17 acres of open space on the site that will be open to the public that will be funded by the project. So the, the open spit, you know, the, the development is funding that and, and you need a, a density of development in order to support all that. If we had lower density districts, we wouldn't be able to provide the open space because we wouldn't have the density that would support it. No, I, th I think, you know, I, I hear it's you. A public, it's a public benefit that's being supported by the project. Yeah, I hear you. And, and, you know, my next comment is going to get into that public space a little bit. Um, in full disclosure, I work for um, the Parks Department. I'm a landscape architect. Mm -hmm. um, and I am concerned about the impacts of Playground 35 uh, from the shadows. Um, I understand the, um, you know, I've, I've looked at the L-Series set. It, it's, you know, um, you know, I, I appreciate the experience expansion of that playground and the expansion of that space along 35th Avenue. I think that's, that particularly is, is a piece of this project that I feel is, is well done. Um, that, that area is really starved for open space and along 35th Avenue that, that playgrounds, you know, it's, it's a decent size, but expanding it uh, just provides all that more benefit. That's right on 35th Avenue um, mm -hmm. and Stein. And I, I understand what you're saying about, the, this this public versus private, but I do think that some of the spaces feel more like they're commercial corridors within the development, as opposed to. And I understand that they're public publicly accessible. I get it, but they they act, in my opinion, they act more as a commercial connection for the residents who are there and for the businesses that are there. And, and that may be a good thing. That may be a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not well-designed. All I'm saying is that, you know, I, I think they're, they are a little more um, private facing being that they're facing in. Um, and I do wish that some of that 2.7 acres was a little bit more public facing spread out, uh, uh, you know, we have, you have six or seven or eight spaces in there that are adding up to this 2.7. And, you know, maybe if that was condensed a little bit more, you can kind of create more, you know, active recreation is really what is needed in this neighborhood. I mean, there isn't really ball fields close by. I'm not, I'm not saying that you're going to fit a football field in here or a, or a soccer pitch or anything like that. But, um, and I know that you have a synthetic turf area there kind of along um, a little bit further south of the development, but, you know, I do feel like those could be enhanced, those larger areas and some of the smaller, com more commercial, private feeling areas. Um, while I don't want to see them go, I think they're, they're, they're nice and the renderings are beautiful. I just wish some of the other more public facing areas were larger enhanced. So well, I, I I know it's true. Just I'm little. saying, what I'm saying is reduce, reduce the height of your, <laughs> reduce the height of your buildings west of the development and add more public space. I know that's not how it works, but you know, I, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. So, yeah. Uh, that's it for me. That's my two points. Thanks, Liz. Sorry, I was muted again. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I would like to, uh, the committee has heard a number of things that have been uh, spoken about with respect to the open spaces. And there were some suggestions that were uh, proposed uh, in Jerry's memo to you um, with respect to the open spaces. And um, it was, uh, are there any comments on that or? Um, There are no comments on that. Well, we had suggested um, at one point that the area adjacent to Playground 35, um, uh, should become an active, an active area, uh, whether it's a small soccer field or um, a small basket court basketball court. And in addition, the there is a private area, private open space. I think it's between 37th and 38th Street. 
I we thought that that should be incorporated into public access, publicly accessible space, um, and it be more active. So uh, I can address those comments. So, so the, the large open space that, that surrounds PG-35 actually has a large lawn that we believe will be a little bit, um, you know, like passive active, right? It'll have uh, things that people can play on it. Kids can kick a ball around it and it'll also be available for, for, um, for uh, other, you know, more active uses, but it is a passive area. Uh, south on 37th Street, um, uh, sorry, on 37th and 38th Street, fronting on 36th Avenue is a, uh, a bifurcated open space. There's a um, one that we have included in the PAAs that will be active open space. Uh, and then there is an open space behind that that is, um, that is the, the, you know, right now it's private. Uh, or it's, it's, it's reserved for the residential tenants. Now, those two locations there are the locations that were for the school. So when you talk about, um, you, you know, using the school space, that's the space where the, where the building would go and that space would go. So we're, we're open to discussing um, how to use that space as we move through Euler. Um, but that's why it's not included right now in the PAAs. Okay. That, 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 res that residential private open space, uh, because that's where the school was and, and that's where um, potentially other uses could go. Okay. Uh, and I'd also like, I want to stress that with the PG-35, we're in active conversations with, with the Parks Department um, on how to um, work uh, the two open spaces together to make them seem more seamless. While it is a, public open space and it needs to be fenced. We're gonna be reducing the fence that's around it. And we've modified um, some of our designs to reflect Parks Department comments on how to meld those two spaces together as part of a larger open space. And we will continue to talk. Okay, I'm a little confused. Was this, you said that the private open space is, was where the school was going to be? That's correct. Okay. So why do I recall there being some talk of community facility where the school space was? I was under the, I got the impression that this was an enclosed part of a building that was now going to be reallocated to some other use. That's, that, that, that's an idea that could be discussed as we move forward during this process. But right, right now, we're, we're, we have it as open space, and we're open to discussing how to utilize that space. So you can annex it to the adjacent building and make it a community facility so space? Uh, Correct. Like that. Okay. Correct. I thought you were talking about something that was interior to the, to the, to the whole project. Okay. Um, let me just go over these. There is still the issue of the fact that this is a very high density area, very high density proposal. It is just not characteristic of Western Queens and what and our neighborhood. And um, we would like to have, as Jeffrey had requested, some kind of response to the con the, the the concept of the staggered massing to move the massing closer to Northern Boulevard, keep it away from 35th Avenue. And um, with respect to using lower districts. Now you're, so your response to our comments that we made earlier about lowering the districts and to Jeffrey's comments was that you need this density in order to provide the open spaces and to sustain that um, is that what you're saying? At well, that, I mean, part of it, yes. It's and a, there's no question of lowering those zones to to lower the density and lower the the pop. You know, yeah. It, it's the oh, you know, the fact that 25 percent roughly of the overall land area is being dedicated for open space, but it's it's actually much more than that. I mean, all the benefits of this project 
There are other rezonings that have occurred in this community board at a similar 7.12 uh, level that are sort of spot rezonings, individual buildings, where you won't have a 60,000 square foot facility for existing community nonprofits to provide services uh, to the, the existing community and the new members of the community. There, there's so many aspects of this project that are made possible by the density, but frankly, the density isn't the thing that is so dissimilar from other projects in the area. It's the fact that we put together five city blocks uh, to create the opportunity for open space and create the opportunity uh, to, uh, to fund these community spaces uh, to allow existing organizations to grow their mission, serve more people. And I just don't want it to be lost on, certainly the open space uh, has an effect on the heights of the buildings, that's undeniable. Uh, but there are other trade-offs that the, the, the density really provides a lot more um, uh, than just that, or is related uh, to not just the um, open space and the heights as well. Elizabeth, if I may, uh, yes, I, think, gonna... uh, I think Jerry is on the call and he needs to be unmuted. Florence or Mark. Okay, please. Uh, and, and I just wanted uh, to piggyback on what Jerry said before. I think uh, we should send our report and the proposed zoning districts to the team so they can take it under consideration and not just give us an answer right now. Maybe you can look at the proposal. Marie, is Jerry in the attendees? That's our the Jerry from the board? Uh, he, he sent an email. Uh, he's on the chat. Saying can you hear me? There he is. Yes. yes okay. 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 Um, okay, thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask a couple of questions and make some comments. Uh, first, as I said a couple of days ago to the borough president, community board one is not opposed to new development, especially when it's not detrimental to the community. This particular development, the way it's masked, has the potential to be detrimental to the community, the immediate community specifically. So that's our concern. Secondly, the subcommittee that met was formed by the chair of the board, came to the conclusion that with the understanding that this is a large scale development and the impact on the adjoining three, three story buildings on 35th Avenue, that our recommendation will be that along 35th Avenue on the project site, that, that no massing would be greater than an R6A height. That would be an eight story. That would be the max along 35th Avenue. You could use the bulk and reposition it as it was mentioned before by Liz with our recommendation as a R7. That would be going 100 feet back from, from 35th. Uh, mid block would be an R7D approximately. Uh, you work it out, work at the detail and R8X along Northern Boulevard. When you, when you mix everything together and you move things around, you'll have a very substantial project, but you'll respect the 35th Avenue corridor. That's, our, that's my comment first. Secondly, the question, I'm very curious because of the, uh, you know, our understanding that a significant part of the open space, that, as you call it, is going to be used as access for commercial retail. In your calculation for income on this project, is there gonna be a cam for the retail stores that they pay for a portion of the, of the upkeep and maintenance of that common area? Did you understand my question? Yeah, I mean, it's very early, but likely there'll be some participation of the retail uh, uh, tendencies in the uh, common charges, but we're, you know, very far from determining what that would look like. So if I'm a retail store and I'm paying for the use of that, for the, for the maintenance and upkeep of that common area, basically I'm renting that common area, which 
you call open space. And, you know, it really, if you go to a shopping mall, that's basically what it's going to look like. Yeah, you may have a couple of planter boxes, a couple of benches, this and that. But when you're going 200 feet from block to block with a commercial, it's basically a commercial corridor. It's like walking down Steinway Street, except you don't have the, you don't have the commercial, the, the, the car automobile traffic. You have, you just have pedestrian traffic. It's fine, but it's not, it's, it's, it's definitely not the feel so-called open space, and especially when you have a 22 story building on one side and a 23 story building on the other. That's not open space. What are you gonna look straight up in the air on? I don't know what the, what should, what's the width of that corridor? 25 feet wide, 50. 30 feet five, even if it's 40 feet wide. 50. I'm sorry, what'd you say, 50? 50 feet wide. And then, you know, a narrow 50. street in the city is 60. And these areas Correct. were uh, regulated by the restrictive declaration to be open to the public from a certain hour in the morning, I think largely 7 a.m. till many of the spaces till I think 10 p.m. at night. The programming will encourage people to come into the project from the uh, surrounding community. I mean, this is- But the only reason why anybody would walk through that would be to shop. Let's that, face it. Uh, I mean, let, let me try to answer that, Jerry. First of all, <clears throat> If you look at the ground floor program, not all of the open space is surrounded by commercial spaces. There are areas that are commercial, there are areas that are community facility, there are areas that are after school education, there's a culture institution adjacent to the Central Park, et cetera, et cetera, number one. But you don't have those locked in. You know, it's, 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 if you had those locked in, then I could understand. Do you have a library? Do you have a hospital? Do you, letters in, of intent from these people. Do you, what, what, what Liz mentioned before, do you have a YMCA? So that's the type of, or a variety of boys and girls. That's the kind of uses we really need in this neighborhood. And we don't need as much passive, we need active recreation, mixed it with the passive. And I think we could, most people would say we need more active recreation, like was, was mentioned by Jeff with the, uh, and Liz with the soccer ball, even basketball, jungle gym, that kind of thing. That's what this neighborhood needs. And that's what it, it's a desert of. So Jerry, one of the things we do have included here is this community innovation hub on block C that's adjacent to the largest open space. And that does include the Queens Public Library. They do not want to the Broadway branch is close by. So what they're proposing to do with us here is to create a tech lab for tech training and workforce development. That 60,000 square foot community innovation hub would also be home for the resettlement folks to do ESOL classes and aftercare. There would be the LGBTQ network is creating a community center there and the ancillary, and there's a model railroad club that would be a part of this, and other groups within the neighborhood that we've been speaking with who don't need bricks and mortar, but want shared spaces for event space or auditorium space. And we're actually trying to lay out rough plans and talk to them about whether gym space or, or other specialized space in this facility would make sense. Um, so we're trying to flush that out, but I think there, this would be a very central community hub that could serve a lot of different existing community groups. Could um, you identify that in percentage uh, residential? And when you take the whole square footage of the entire project, just to put it into perspective, and you took the residential, you took the commercial, and you take what you're calling community facility, what would be the percentage of the community, the uses that would really be hands-on with the people who live there that they would benefit by it? As the innovation, what you just mentioned, or incubator space, whatever you're calling it. How, what so would be the percentage? I don't know the, sorry, Jay, do you know the percentage off the top of your head? 
speak to it in real terms. It's a hundred thousand square feet. It's it's a meaningful amount of space that's dedicated for nonprofit community serving organizations. It's the overall project is two point seven and a something and change million square feet, but a hundred thousand square feet dedicated for this purpose is meaningful. And I, I wouldn't minimize how much space that is. That's going to we already that's have two big box stores. Uh, this is. Uh, I just uh, want to say that the percentage should be looked at as a percentage of the ground floor activity, the ground and second floor activity. There's no use of a community facility up on the eighth or 12th floor. So as a hundred thousand square foot at the ground floor is a substantial percentage of the ground floor activated space. If you compare that at the ground floor general thing. I also want to say something in general about the open space because this keeps on coming back. And I want to point out that we've got here some of the longest blocks, city blocks in the city. Some of them are 600 feet long. It's not typical. So these blocks are extremely long and relentless in terms of the ability to activate such a long block without intersection, especially on side streets that are not on 35th Avenue, right, or Steinway. And so if you were to fill the, what, what we call to fill the, the bulk, build the entire block as a regular development would do, you would face a very long 600 feet and very narrow sidewalk against a street wall that continues relentlessly without a stop. And if there's gonna be any open space in this model, it would be the inside of the donut, if you will, it usually belongs to only the residents of the building. So by creating those pockets of expansion of the sidewalk, we break down the, the linear block of 600 feet. We tend, then reverse what otherwise would be private communal space into a public space. And then we connect them as a sequence of uh, uh, public spaces that look into one another and then activate them at the ground floor with a mix of community facility and retail. And I, so I'm, I'm a bit surprised about the feeling that these spaces, which are totally open to the public and their natural extension of the sidewalk, it's really linear expanding the amount of perimeter that surrounds a public space is not embraced as a public space. Yeah. And I just add that- uh, It's being embraced to, to, to answer, it's being embraced but not at, the, not at the price of uncharacteristic massing of the buildings at the expense of the shadows and, and, and just the impact on the, on the lower density zones adjoining. Because if, if that was the case, then why not go halfway, block, halfway up the block on the north side of the, uh, uh, across the street and rezone uh, the three-story buildings to R6A. But the, unfortunately, they don't have that advantage. They're only three stories. There are five. They're not getting the benefit. You're taking advantage of the benefit by going for a zoning change. And just to dispute the content, concept of if you had a whole block of huge buildings, you never get that approved. The whole concept of a large-scale development, we all know, is that the masking is key and locked in. It's like a variance; it gets locked in. So, if you, you so the 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 concept of just doing a, a whole block of five blocks of R nine is unfathomable. This is not Manhattan, so it's not it's not reality. So we're trying to put this into reality. We want the development, but we don't want it to kill us, and we want it to benefit us, and we don't want it to be isolated. We want it to blend in. We appreciate the fact of the corridors and the, but you know, it's, it's debatable whether they're really for the benefit of the community other than for the shoppers, unless you could really point out that each one of those corridors is gonna have something to benefit the community other than a retail store. And that has not been demonstrated yet, but, at least Jerry, graphically. I would like to speak to that specific point because we have uh, agreements with probably close to you know, 10, a dozen of these partners that you see that Tracy described 
for a certain amount of space for this, uh, you know, ESL programs, a certain amount of space uh, for a medical clinic with the floating hospital. I mean, we are, uh, we are- Can't they be identified on the master plan in a location? Well, we, we're, not, yes. we're not, we're not at, well, sorry, go ahead, Tracy. Well, we did no. that, we did that. Yeah, the, there's, the, the current presentation includes some of that and, and we could certainly, walk you through it um, or, or clarify it further because um, like I said, four of these groups wanna be part of the community hub that's on block C. The floating hospital has identified a location that works well for them and their adjacent daycare center on block D. So, so it, and the museum wants to be proximate to their existing facility on block A as does pioneer work. So yes, we have identified locations for these folks. And those are in the presentation. So I don't know if it would be helpful for those to see that again, since we already went through it earlier and there seems to be some confusion about what, what that was representing. I think it would be helpful for everyone to see the graphic. And so Jerry, I don't know if you can see, uh, if you're in transit or if you can see it or, or if you've seen the presentation that was sent previously, but that, that was what we were trying to portray. And what I what I think we're I trying to, what I think we're trying to communicate. I mean, the 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 Jerry, you said the the desire to make a vibrant. Or, or Ron, before you go, can you go to the next slide, please, which shows the partners? Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you missed that point, uh, and it's still in the works because we're consistently trying to find partners to dedicate spaces uh, for those areas. The blue areas is the community facility spaces and the partners that were there. But I think, uh, again, collectively, and I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out to this committee uh, to be a bit, um, to be specific about the criticism of the arrangement of the floor area or the density. And to say again, that if you look at the arrangement that we have here, and you were in theory to fill up all of those green spaces with buildings, you will get a series of five city blocks with 600 feet of linear block with nothing else but lobbies and residence. And all we're doing is rearranging it in a way that by the way, took a lot of efforts to convince many people because it's more expensive to do, it's more expensive to build, and all of these public spaces have to be maintained in perpetuity to do something that actually makes a difference for the public space. And yet you guys are coming back and kind of demanding to close those op open spaces with a lower structure. So essentially we're taking what could be filled up with lower, lower structure and we're relocating it in a way to open up those spaces. And in addition, to dedicate a tremendous amount of program at the ground floor that is intentional, it's orchestrated for the benefits of the large community. There's nothing obvious about this. So just to, just to belabor the point just a bit more, we just suggested R8X on Northern Boulevard, R7D mid block, and R6A maximum eight stories on uh, 35th Avenue. If you were to rework very simply, without great pains, taking all the floor area that you're allowed, leaving the open space that you have, just shifting things around, would you lose any square footage? It's not about square footage, Jerry. Because you're, you have yeah, it is. It's all about square footage. Square footage equates to money, dollars and cents, simply said. I'm an architect. You know that. I do it all the time. So the bottom line is, the question is, if you, I just want to know if you tried, if you didn't try, if you didn't try, and we don't know the answer. But if you tried and you said, Jerry and the board, it doesn't work. The project would not happen if that was the case. Then we could then we could we come back and and we talk about it because well, we need to we have to come up with a rationale. We're looking yeah. at it as a community board, not as a developer. We're looking at it. We have to face those masses of people that you heard in the Museum of Moving Image, not today, 
not tomorrow, but 10 years from now. After this project is approved and built, it doesn't go away. Right. I've been doing this for long enough to know that. Yeah, uh, that's both of us. I think Jerry ex explained before that the way that this entire development started, and you can appreciate that we've, uh, uh, this is a, a result of endless work sessions with city planning. There's a lot of people with a lot of opinions, uh, <clears throat> but the, the generic, the genesis of it is just fill the bowl, build uh, five blocks that are flat, uh, uh, all the same height that fills the entire block. Uh, and that's where we started. You, you and I would agree that that's but, not- But that's, that's not what we're asking. And that's not what we expect. Let me, just, let me just finish. Then we've done many different options by which the density is concentrated on different locations of the site. And we worked endlessly, both with city planning, through uh, shadow studies and other impacts to place them in, a, in the, the, the least uh, sort of uh, offensive location and architecturally and urbanistically to minimize the shadows uh, in order to, uh, to create the, the best locations here. For example, if you look at block C that has the big park uh, opening, we all thought that it's appropriate to have the taller building surrounding it on three sides, anchoring 35th and Steinway with one, and then the other corner with another. Now, what is the appropriateness of that? Because there's a, there's a large, very large open space, unlike any other within that country. What about the people across the street? Do they not count? No, everybody counts, uh, Jerry. You so, ask then, the so then you have to respect the community with which you are entering. That's uh, our point. And I think it's, it's been unanimously mentioned. So uh, I think you have to go back and look at that. We want the development. We would prefer to have it open from 35th up to Northern. We, we don't expect to see 22 story buildings, anything more than eight stories on 35th Avenue. There's no real, you know, I, I made this point before. If I'm doing a building in Whitestone or Malba or, or Forest Hills and a, and a R2 zone, just because I have a whole block and I own the whole block, doesn't mean I could go up 40 stories. You understand what I'm getting at? There's, there's got to be a zoning rationale. If I have all one story buildings around, I can't go up 40 stories. I have to respect the rest of the community. And that's what we're asking for. We're asking for you to look at the context more closely. We're not telling you to lose the density. We're not telling you to lose the bulk. We like the, we I like the staggering of buildings. We like the open space. We like the uses. We think it's a thoughtful project, but we have to answer to the people and they're telling us. No, that, that's fantastic. What I suggest is if you can please send us again, what the in terms of the height and placements of bulk, what is your recommendation? Because it's hard at this forum to understand exactly what you have in mind. And we would love to look at this and respond in, in, in specifically to what you said, because there were endless okay. studies that were, that were made. We think that this is the best solution, but we might be missing something. I'll be happy, we'll be happy to receive that and, and respond specifically to your comment. You can send a sketch or whatever tools you want to use. Perfect, thank you. May we have the screen back, please, Aram? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jerry. Are you um, are you finished with your comments? I am. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, you will stay. I hope, Jerry. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Evie, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Just going back to the racial equity study. I'm just wondering what's the timeline for that because the tool is available. I mean, we can go in right now and you can see the risk for displacement in this area. So I'm just wondering, is it gonna be ready for May 25th? Well, the answer to that question is no. While the tool was available, we just are getting the methodologies from city planning and HP yesterday. 
So it's going to take some time to take it and synthesize it and put it into a report, which will then need to be discussed with city planning uh, before it's released. We expect it to take a month or so. Okay. So a month or so, uh, it would be done before June 21st? It's possible. Because June 21st is when the community board is going to vote on this. We understand that. It's possible, but part of it is out of our control. We just had the methodology with, from city planning yesterday. Okay. And, and then just a, to redo a, it. a question about the small businesses who are being displaced or have been displaced. I asked this question before about a relocation plan or affordable space for them. Not the big, not the movie theater, because they're gonna go where, you know, there's a billiard hall, there's some other small businesses there. I'm talking about the actual smaller businesses that are not seeing their leases renewed. So th there's a number of different uh, businesses, Evie. Some of them are owner-occupied spaces that we're looking to relocate uh, prior to this proposal even coming into existence. One. There's a number of different types of uses. So um, I don't have a specific answer for every single one, but we will be talking with all of the businesses. Some of these businesses, right, well, if this proposal is approved, wouldn't be disrupted for, for 10 years. And so um, it's, it's unclear what all of that means. Um, but we certainly will be speaking with these businesses through this process uh, and ones who are currently there and want to relocate there and can relocate there. We're, we're obviously going to entertain all those conversations and continue those conversations, but it's not a single answer. Well, I mean, this has been in development for almost 10 years now and, you know, the plans for this and. Oh, know, that's, 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 that's not true for my involvement. So I can't necessarily speak okay. that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, if that's in general, accurate. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. 10, almost 10 years since. Yeah, we, we haven't, so I can't, I'm sorry, I can't speak to that. And then in September, I think it was of 2020, I, I asked about a relocation plan and I was told we're working on it. So now you're still saying, and I know you came into this later, that it's still being worked on. Yeah, it's, it's an evolving process. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Evie. Uh -huh. Um, Marie, do you have any comment? I, there are no more hands, no more questions. Yes, uh, not a comment. I'm hoping, I'm going back to Evie's point about receiving uh, the rents and the income bans. When will we get that? We thought we would have had it tonight. Are we gonna have it for the public hearing? Yes, you'll have it tomorrow. We've submitted something previously, I don't recall the exact date, sometime in March to the community board that did include some breakdown by units and income level, but we'll find, if you provide the format that you want the information in, we will reformat uh, what we previously provided to be responsive. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that too. Since we already sent a package, it would be helpful um, if that didn't contain all the information that you were looking for, maybe you could advise us on what was missing and then we can follow up. Well, I, just a question, is the income bans and the rents different, going to be different for the senior portion of uh, the affordable housing? Likely so. So MIH option one is, 60, is an average of 60% AMI with 10% at 40% AMI, 10% at 60% AMI, and I believe 5% at 120% AMI. Uh, the senior housing is likely to be more deeply affordable uh, under the senior housing. So uh, what I'm asking is, will that be reflected in the charts that you sent or is it already? Uh, no, uh, because the, currently the programs that exist for senior housing, uh, it's, we, uh, we can't provide that information today because the programs are changing. So, um, uh, but certainly it'll be likely less uh, lower income levels than the MIH units, as most senior housing is. Okay, um, also uh, going back to Jerry's point, uh, we're going to send you our recommendation for zoning districts, um, probably tomorrow if we could do that for us. And when could we expect an answer uh, on our recommendation? Try, try to have something, something before, before the next community meeting. Before the next community board meeting, the, the 
public hearing. The public hearing, and it, okay. if we're unable to get it by then, it'll be before the, the next, definitely before the next land use committee meeting. Would be great if we could have it before the public hearing. Understood. Thank you. That's all I have, Alyssa. Okay. Uh, before I close the meeting, anyone else? No, thank you. I want to thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen from the project team. Um, we appreciate it. You will hear from us. And um, I hope we can resolve the differences we have here. So uh, with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Thank you. And thank you. And see you all next thank week. Thank you all. We'll see you on the <laughs> right. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye-bye.